One day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they've poured water over their cupped hands, as required by their ancient traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they immerse their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions they have clung to, such as their ceremonially, ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, Why don't your disciples follow your, our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. And Jesus replied, You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. Then he said, You skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God. Honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father and mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, Sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents. And so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own traditions. And this is only one example among many others. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd, and his disciples asked him what he meant by the parable he had just used. Don't you understand either? he asked. Can't you see that the food you put into your body can't defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. Then he added, It is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a, a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Jesus, the law, and getting clean. We are actually now, uh, we're about halfway through the Gospel of Mark, but in the sermon series, we're getting close to the end because during uh, Holy Week, you know, we get the last third of it. So we're getting towards the end. And really, Mark is preparing us for the events of the Passion and for Holy Week uh, by now he's really kind of bringing a whole bunch of stuff together. And, and um, kind of what, he, what he's bringing together here, um, what he's bringing together is this idea of clean and unclean. That is absolutely central to everything Mark has to say to us. This, this idea of, of being clean, that is, uh, fit to enter into God's presence, or unclean, unfit to enter into God's presence. And so um, we're going we're gonna to see some of that as we walk through the text here. And having come from Jerusalem, the, uh, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him, and they witnessed some of the disciples consuming their bread with common hands. That's literally what it says in the Greek, that they had common hands. The Greek word is koine. Uh, when I went to seminary, I had to study koine Greek, which means uh, common, every day, as opposed to like uh, you know Homer writing the Odyssey and the Iliad and, and all the ancient poets. They wrote in classical Greek, kind of highfalutin Greek. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, Peter, James, Paul. They wrote in everyday language. They used everyday terms, and that's how Jesus taught. Jesus didn't teach using kind of highfalutin language. Uh, it kind of personally, it drives me nuts whenever I hear someone else preach and they start using all kinds of church words and, and code. There's, you know, we have our own language here in the church because anybody who's not in the club then doesn't know what they mean. Jesus didn't teach that way. Jesus taught like there was a farmer who went out to plant 
Or there was a guy who had two sons. Common, everyday things. And that's the problem the Pharisees have with the disciples here is they ate with their common hands. Um, what we would say here, really, we would say the word would be secular. They ate with their secular hands. That's kind of what it means. Because they hadn't gone through the ceremony of, of washing their hands, not to wash away the dirt so they'd have clean hands to eat, like we want our kids to do all the time. They, they had a ceremony they washed, as best as we can tell, because they call it washing with the fist. And so people think, they think it was like you would take, put them in the water and take one hand and rub the palm like that, and then you do the other. They, so they didn't wash with the fist is really what it, it says. We're not 100% sure what it looked like, but they would wash their hands before they eat because they want to make sure that their hands and the food and the plate they're eating off of is ceremonially clean, that it is not common, that it is not what we would say secular, what they called in, in ages past the profane. They had the holy and the profane. They think, they, we can't just use these things. And I'll give you a little heads up. Uh, we had a, to put this kind of in our, in our context here of us, our chalice, you know, sprung a leak. And we had some discussions I had with the ladies in the office. We had it with the, with the council, with the worship committee. What do we want to do? Because, surprise, surprise, the Bible doesn't tell us what kind of chalice to use. We, yeah, it would be so much easier, wouldn't it, if the Bible just told us what chalice to use. We can use any chalice we want. We could spend a couple of grand and get one that's gold-laced and has gems on it and looks really fancy. Or one of us could bring a, a cup from home with little orange flowers on the side of it. It's up to us. Um, because it's not the cup that makes communion. It's our faith that makes communion. And that's where we're going. That's where Jesus is going with all of this. That, that these guys, they're complaining. Oh, they're using their common hands. They're using their secular hands. They're using their everyday hands to eat. And that's just not right. So then this is a commentary by Mark. Mark says, For unless they first ceremonially wash their hands, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat. They hold fast to the traditions of the elders that are outside the command of God. Here's something really important. Jesus never says the traditions are wrong. He just says they don't take precedence over God's word. God has a command, singular, the command of God. This is why when Jesus was asked, what is the most important commandment? He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. Love your neighbors yourself. Every command is encompassed in these two. That's the command of God. To love God, to love our neighbor. That's why, why Mark says it in the singular here. The command of God, meaning the totality of all these instructions. He said, but they're putting their traditions, which are outside the commands of God, above the commands of God. And Jesus is going to go into some details about how they do that and why they're wrong. He says, also, they won't eat food from the market unless it's dipped. That's what it says, it's dipped. Actually, in the Greek, it says unless it's baptized. But that'd be kind of weird to say you have to baptize your food before you eat it. Uh, but that's what baptized means, to dip. Uh, and many other traditions are received and kept. Cupped pitchers and bronze kettles are dipped. All these, all these ceremonies they have to go through before they'll eat with them. And the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why don't your disciples behave according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with common hands? They want to know what's going on here. Why hasn't Jesus, is supposed to be a holy man, why hasn't he taught his disciples the proper holy procedure that you're supposed to go through before you eat? They, they are eating with their common hands. Uh, Boy, I could really start a hornet's nest if I wanted to. Well, not so much with you guys, because you guys are you're just great to work with. But in some churches, probably churches some of you have gone to, things like that kind of music isn't proper in church. Those kind of clothes aren't proper in church. You know what Jesus says? I don't care. That's what Jesus says. I don't care. 
What I care about is that you are made clean through the forgiveness of sins so you can enter into God's presence. Whether you do that with an organ or a band or no instruments at all is up to you. Whether you're wearing a suit and a tie or shorts and flip-flops is up to you. I just want to make you clean so you can come into God's presence. But these Pharisees are all hung up on, on how they're doing things. Do you remember, it was my first or second sermon here. I said, I, wouldn't, I don't wear vestments. But the minute someone says to me, I can't, I'm going to go get them out of the closet and put them on. I can't. Wear them. I can't. <laughs> you know, that's because you want me to. <laughs> the minute someone says, I can't, and means it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not whether I wear the vestments or not. It's the preaching of the word. The Pharisees, yeah, it's the heart. The Pharisees are all caught up in this, in this washing of the hands. And so in response to them, uh, he said to them, Isaiah prophesies correctly about you pretenders, you hypocrites. You pretend to be one thing and you're something else. You're just pretending to be these holy people of God. He wrote that these people respect me with their lips, but their hearts are relationally distant from me. As a result, they worship we, me with nothing to show for it. Really, really important. This is a debate that rages among pastors and theologians and biblical scholars. Is Why do we have worship services? All Christians say we got to get together, mostly on Sunday morning, and we got to worship. The question is, what's going on? For a Lutheran, there's only one answer. We come before God to have our sins forgiven so we can be clean and enter into God's presence. The moment we think worship is about us being entertained and having fun, we've lost it. And the moment we think uh, we're so doing something for God in our worship, we've lost it. God doesn't need anything for us. We have nothing we can offer him. We are here to have our sins forgiven so we can be clean and enter into God's presence through the forgiveness of sins. It's that simple. And that's why he says to me, they worship with nothing to show for it. They're not getting out of worship what worship is supposed to do. They're not getting into God's presence because it's all for show. And they teach human teachings as God's commands. Think of, uh, some of you, I don't need to go into any detail on that one, do I? Um, the, think of an athlete playing in a game. Uh, sometimes they say this, you know, his heart just isn't in it. He's just out there going through the motions. And if you follow sports, you've, we've all seen games like that. That's what these Pharisees are doing. They're just going through the motions. They've got step A, you do this. Step B, you do that. Step C, you do that. And if you do all that thing, magically something happens and your sins are forgiven. That's nothing. Then doesn't matter if you believe anything. Jesus goes on, you push away the godly commands of God. And you hold on to the traditions of the people. Remember, the traditions are outside the commands of God. doesn't mean they're bad or wrong. It just means they're outside. So we've got to have priority here. You do a good job of invalidating the godly commands of God in order to keep the traditions you established. They got their priorities backwards. They put their traditions over the commands of God, the godly commands of God, as I've translated it there. They put their traditions over it, so they nullify it. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and the one speaking evil against father or mother dies death. That's the way in Greek they would say to be put to death, uh, to, be, to be executed as opposed to murdered. They're being executed by the, by the uh, authorities here because they spoke evil against their parents. It's right there in, in the commands of Moses. But, <clears throat> Jesus goes on, but you say if a person tells father or mother whatever assistance you expected from me is Corbin, you turn a blind eye. And they no longer do anything for father or mother. Corbin is uh, this Leviticus chapter 27. You can go look it up. Uh, Corbin originally was a way people could pledge money to the working of the tabernacle before the tabernacle was before the temple was built. They pledge money to the tabernacle basically to pay the salaries of the people who work there. So what, what, what happened though, because this isn't a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins or reconciliation or anything like that, what this is is this is uh, 
something extra. This is above and beyond anything that's expected of, it to, of anyone. And, and what happened was people thought, well, if I give Corbin, if I pay the salary of these workers, then I'm going to get a special blessing from God. And so that's what Jesus says. You say, if it's Corbin, if you're paying the salary of the temple workers, well, think of it this way. Say you got it. your parents are in the nursing home, and you go to your parents and you say, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to pay for your room this month at the nursing home because I'm going to pay the pastor's salary. Jesus says, no. This, is, this would be the worst text I could possibly choose for a, a, a stewardship sermon because what Jesus says is don't give your money to the church. Take care of your parents. This is, it's, it's, again, it's not going through the motions. It's what, what's in, coming from the heart. He says, you say someone doesn't have to take care of their parents in their old age, which Moses said you have to. You say, if I give it to the church, I don't have to take care of them. He said, that's just wrong. Take care of your parents. You're invalidating something that's the word of God for a tradition that started out innocently enough. It started out as just a way to pay the funds for the people taking care of the tabernacle, and it, and it kind of morphed into this way of trying to buy, uh, trying to buy God's favor. Kind of sounds like Martin Luther, <laughs> the sale of indulgences. Luther say, stop trying to buy forgiveness when it's given. You can't buy something that's given to you for free. And calling the crowd to himself again, he said, listen and hear me all and understand. Nothing exists outside of a person that goes into the person that has ability to cause that person to be unclean. Jesus might as well, might, might as well have said, go on down to Burlington and go through the drive through and get a pulled pork sandwich that's always being advertised there on the billboard. Eat a pulled pork sandwich. Go and get a bacon cheeseburger. Doesn't matter, because when you eat that, it doesn't go to your heart. Now, I know I got some doctors here, and I'm talking bacon, and they'll say <laughs> cholesterol. That's not what Jesus is talking about. We're, we're talking about ritualistically, religiously, that food doesn't enter your heart and make you unclean. So if the disciples religiously wash their hands, go through the ceremony, or they don't, Jesus is saying, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Because it's the state of their heart that matters. And listen to what he says on that. So he leaves the crowd. The disciples say, we don't get it. And, he's, and, I, and I, forgot, I should have a question mark there. In this way, are you without the ability to un consider and understand too? He's like, don't you get it? Don't you understand it? You've been with me all these years and you still don't get it? Everything outside that goes into the person is unable to cause that person to become unclean. And here he goes into the details. Because things going into the person don't enter the heart, but go into the stomach and go out into the toilet. And then Mark puts this editorial in there, causing all food to be clean. So we can go have a, a pulled pork sandwich if we want, or a bacon cheeseburger. He said then, what comes out of the person causes them to be clean. What comes, what's already in you and comes out. From inside a person's heart comes thoughts that lack moral goodness. That's, that's literally what it means in the, the Greek. The quality that makes the commands of God, the commands of God, the quality that God puts into them, his own goodness, uh, they, these things, they lack that. What's in our heart lacks that. And, and what comes out is sexual immoralities, stealing, murders, adulteries, malicious deeds. You notice those are all in the plural. Uh, deceit, debauchery, the evil eye, that's envy, defamation of character, arrogance, foolishness, all of these, the evil within, come out and cause a person to be clean, unclean. Jesus is saying basically, it's nonsense if you think not ceremonially washing your hands will make you unclean, because you're already unclean. All these things are already in your heart. Uh, your, your broken hearts, broken as in don't work right. Your hearts don't work right, they're broken. All these things are already in there, and, and Jesus is saying, that's those things coming out, they're making us unclean. They're making us unfitted to enter into God's presence. And, and uh, so then we come to the main point. Jesus isn't interested in if something is 
kind of quote unquote holy or unholy, sacred or secular. His job is to make us clean because we're unclean in our hearts. We cannot make ourselves clean, but must depend on his death and resurrection to make us clean. The church, meaning the the big picture here, universal church has made a lot of mistakes over the years. The number one mistake I think the church ever made was once that first generation of Christians was gone, they forgot this lesson. And they decided that, that it was about separating things into holy and unholy and, and sacred and secular. And that's the whole monastic movement started and these people thought, we're going to be holy, we're going to be closer to God. And other people believed them and so they started paying them and giving them gifts to pray for them, saying, you're closer to God than we are, so your prayers matter more than ours. 1,500 years, finally Martin Luther comes along and says, that's a bunch of nonsense. What a bunch of nonsense. We are the priesthood of all believers. The scripture's right there that, that we are made clean by Christ. And if you're made clean through the forgiveness of sins, it doesn't matter if you're a pastor up in front or if you're the person sitting in the pew. If you're made clean, you're made clean by Christ and you have Christ's righteousness in you. All this other stuff, uh, just keep he's not saying it's bad. He's saying keep it in perspective. If we want to be a fan, do a fancy service, we can do a fancy service. We want to do a simple service, we can do a simple service. That's not what matters. What matters is coming before God and having our sins forgiven so we can be fit to enter into God's presence. And, and really here what Mark is doing is he's tying it all together for us to say this is where it's going. The, the act that Jesus does to make us clean is coming up really, really soon. So Mark wants to make sure we get this. That it, is, that it is being made clean, being made clean through the forgiveness of sins, that repentance and forgiveness make us fit to enter into God's presence. Not what we do, not what we don't do, but being made clean by Christ, having our hearts renewed. Um, next week we're going to get a little bit of an example in this, in uh, a living parable in Mark chapter 8. So let us pray. Lord God, we pray that this lesson will sink deep, deep into our hearts. That, that uh, you will help us to understand that being a Christian, number one, means that we are made clean by you. That, that we turn away from our sin in repentance. We turn to you. And when we turn to you, our sins are forgiven. And we are made clean. We are, we are spotless as new fallen snow. And, and we are washed clean through your death. And we have your resurrection as a promise that that cleansing has taken place so that we can go out into the world and live as your people. People who have had the burdens of our hurt and our sorrows lifted from us so that we can live in the joy of your presence. And we give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen.